The Publishing for Profit podcast is brought to you by Ghostwriters and Co. Earn more money by publishing better content and learn how to increase your thought leadership so you can build your brand. Head over to ghostwritersandco.com for more information. That's ghostwritersandco.com. And now, your host, Joel Mark Harris. Hello, and welcome to the Publishing for Profit podcast. This is your host, Joel Mark Harris. We are interviewing James Gardner today, who is a high-performance coach with Leap Zone Strategies. He has a very interesting background. He was a world-class athlete as a rower. He got into acting, moved to New York, then LA, and then up to Vancouver. Uh, so we talk a lot about uh, you know, what motivated him, we talk about who he hope helps as a high performance coach and what he's up to today. He is in the process of writing a memoir, a book, uh, so that will be released shortly. Uh, so we talk about how he wrote it and his writing process. So this is a great interview. Um, he's a super interesting guy. And so hopefully you enjoy. Hi, James. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Hey, Joel. I am fantastic. Great to be here. And uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Awesome. I want to start off with rowing. And I was listening to a podcast that you're on. And you started your rowing career because of a Rob Lowe movie that you saw. Is I mean, there's got to be a great story to that. <laughs> well, there is, I suppose. Uh, the end result was great. The, 80s movies i mean come on you know like uh i love you know, 80s movies they're my I favorite know. yeah yeah i know uh some of them are definitely heavy on the cheese but uh yeah you know i was at <laughs> it was called oxford blues and okay. uh, and it's a story about uh rob lowe's character who's this brash young american who who is a rower and he he's a single rower so he rows by himself and he falls in love for this you know, English lady and wants to go to Oxford. And when he goes to Oxford, he learns and joins the rowing team. Uh, so it was a, it was a really, it was a first insight into, into the world of rowing in terms of the, of the cultural history, the tradition behind rowing, mm -hmm. which I had no idea um, was there. And neither did, neither does Rob Lowe in the movie. And it's, it's kind of a hard journey for him to, uh, to put his ego aside for, for the good of the team. So yeah and so, and so you had quite the career as a rower can you can uh, tell us a little bit about that and and um yeah because you went into coaching as well yeah. and you so you got quite into it just because of this one movie it's it true seems. It's, yeah <laughs> it's true i mean it, it the movie was a catalyst uh and rowing is one of the few sports still to this day where you can walk on as a freshman at university without ever having touched an oar in your life. Most people come into rowing without ever rowing before the university level, especially in the States mm -hmm. where I'm from. And uh, I wanted to play sports and it was an opportunity. And I'm very much of a team guy. So it seemed like a natural fit. And, uh, and then it, it just, I fell in love with it. It's, um, it's beauty, it's rhythm, it's power it's team, it's selflessness, it's all these amazing things that come together. And, and uh, yeah, when I went in, I went all in. And uh, I spent about seven years um, going uh, on the university circuit, including a, a couple of uh, medals at the nationals in, in the university circuit. And then I get invited into the US national system, uh, development system. So uh, I've, you know, I've won a ton of medals uh, in that journey, uh, which culminated in, uh, in 1991, I was, uh, I was uh, representing the North squad at the United States Olympic Festival. And so what that is, is uh, in the States, every, every non-Olympic year, they have North, South, East, East, West. They bring people together to participate in pre-Olympic games. And it's, I mean, it's decked out just like it's the Olympics. Hmm. We went to LA, 
there was an Olympic village. We were decked out in all the swag, the music, the Olympic anthem is playing everywhere. And, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, and my partner and I won the gold medal. So it was, uh, it was my quote unquote Olympic moment, even though it wasn't quite the Olympics, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then, it, and then it, then it evolved into coaching as well. So I became a head coach for a number of years. Uh, ironically, I left the sport Joel for about 15 years and, and reconnected uh, just shy of, of 40. And then I, I, got back into competing and coaching. And, and then I, I went on the international circuit as a master's athlete and uh, did, did quite well. Canadian champ, uh, second in the US in my age category. And so it was, it was a good end of a journey to a, a, a chapter of my life, if you will. Mm. And have you always enjoyed, I mean, I'm assuming that you're, you know, for lack of better uh, term, a bit of a jock, uh, enjoy athletics growing up. What other sports did you play? Well, thank you, because I never considered myself a jock. I, the, the thing about I, me I say I, it in the most endearing way. By oh, the yeah, way. no, yeah. no, totally. <laughs> I wanted to be the jock yeah. when I was a kid. I, so I grew up with asthma. Mm. And so I was very timid and frail. I was always in the hospital. And so I played basketball and I played little league baseball but I never could really I was never really good good mm. and even though I wanted to be and I nor could I feel like I could always participate because of my asthma so I have I, I because I'm a coach I, I can look objectively at myself I, I have the ability I have coordination so I can do a lot of things I can try sports that I've never done and, and do pretty well at them. So I, obviously that was there from a, from a younger age, of course. Mm. Uh, but it's funny, I, I always wanted to be the jock and I, cause I, I and I, I talk about this in my book that I'm writing, I, I assumed being a hero with being the, the jock who had the varsity jacket because when I was in high school and even in middle school, that's all the girls would talk to with, with those guys, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so. Anyway, there's my and, jock story. <laughs> so did you grow out of your asthma? Um, you know, again, listening to, to you talk about it, uh, I, I really connected with your stories about your asthma because, I mean, I had asthma growing up as well, not nearly as severe as you did. Uh, my dad had really severe asthma, and, and he told me about how he uh, would be in bed days and days and he would not be able to go out or do anything. And and that was actually funny enough. That's where his love of reading came, which he passed down to me. So in a way, you know, the reading writing um, aspect of his life is from the asthma. Um, so how did you overcome that challenge uh, to become, you know, a, you know, world-class athlete? Well, to answer your first question, I, I'm looking over there because my, my asthma inhaler is still on the counter. Mm. So I, I still I still deal with it. Uh, it's more of a an itch that scratches one that I need to scratch once in a while. It's not it's it's definitely not been in the driver's seat for a long time. Um, it was an interesting journey, Joel, because what what culminated before I joined rowing, and there's a reason why I, I joined rowing too, was uh, I got to the point in my senior year, it was my senior year in high school, and I had an asthma attack in the middle of the night. Uh, as you know, I mean, asthmatics, allergies, all of these things kind of change of seasons. And, you know, like, so I, I could sneeze and have an asthma attack. I could cough. My nose would get solid. My sinuses would swell up. And and uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and I couldn't breathe. Um, well, actually, I was just having an asthma attack. I went to the bathroom and I woke up with paramedics around me. And, and so what had transpired was I, I had stopped breathing and, and, and my dad uh, took a spoon and had to pry my mouth open to, to give me mouth to mouth. Uh, and the paramedics came and I was, I was kind of, when I, when I came to, I was fine. Like I felt completely normal hmm. other than I was, basically naked on my bathroom floor with strangers around me, right? Um, so, but it was a defining moment for me, Joel, because 
that very next day, the very next day, I had a tennis match um, in high school that I was playing. And, and so I was, there was no way in hell I was not going to that tennis match. And so I remember distinctly, it was the one time in my life where I, I played way above my pay grade. Like I was, I, I was playing out of my skin. I, it was almost as if I was playing against the asthma on the other side of the net, if you will. Mm. And I was die. I had bloody knees. I was diving. I was making all these shots that I would never make in a normal day. Uh, and, the, and the match went on where everyone else had finished their matches. So now the whole two teams are watching me and this, this guy go to five sets in the, in the final or yeah, in five sets, a uh, tiebreaker in the final. And I lost. And, uh, to this day, though, it wasn't it wasn't a loss because I won, and and from that moment, I I vowed that I would never let asthma take control of my life again, and and that's why that summer when I saw Oxford Blues, I'm like, I'm gonna row, and my asthma specialist said, uh, no, you shouldn't row, and I'm like, I'm gonna row, you know, I was called to do it, and it wasn't easy. I I. Uh, Thankfully, that's when I got my inhaler. So I got my inhaler right before I joined the rowing team. So that helped. Mm. I, you know, I would have it in my, my, my spandex, my tights, and I'd have it in the boat, duct taped to the side of the boat. And, you know, uh, and it was still a process because uh, I was still cardiovascularly weak. But what you would, you would ask, the question you asked in terms of how did I overcome it, it was the physical demands of the sport that strengthened my my heart and my lungs ability uh, to to when I started to have attacks they weren't as profound because my lung capacity was getting stronger my heartbeat was getting stronger uh, and, and the ability to to allow me to breathe even through an attack so and as that as that started to grow and my fitness started to really peak it it just didn't seem to have a stranglehold on me as much you know, mm. yeah. What is it that you really enjoy about rowing? Oh man, you got a few hours. <laughs> I do. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Right. Good. All right. You know, Joel, it's. I may be biased here, but I'm going to give you my opinion because you asked. <laughs> uh, rowing to me, <laughs> rowing to me is the ultimate team sport. I don't care what anyone says. There's no timeouts. There's no offense, defense. There's no, someone can, the play's over here, so that person can fuck off, pardon my French, for two, for 30 seconds or for five seconds or whatever while the play's whistled dead. Um, you're in a boat, and when you're in an eight-man boat, there's eight, there's nine souls, there's eight rowers and, and a coxswain, and every move is inextricably linked to the next if you're off a millimeter, your partner has to compensate that and feel the boat and feel. And so, and you're on water and you're against the wind and there's all these elements and you have 12 foot oars that extend out with all these variables. And so, and you're giving everything you have on it. It's like, it's like doing a, a, a leg, a thousand pound, thousand pound leg press on a tightrope. That's exactly the way to think of it. 250 times in a row. And so it's, it's such a, it's such a aggressive, violent sport in a shell of beauty and rhythm and a team dynamic where everything, once you step foot in that boat, ego goes, there's no, there's no room for it. Um, a rowing shell does not suffer ego. And, uh, you're in it when you're in that boat you're not in it for yourself you're in it for the guy in front of you the guy behind you the guy up at the back of the boat wherever it is and that's what i love about it it's it's going into into battle for the man next to you not not for self glory 100 so i think this is a good segue to my next question is you know obviously being a high performance coach you coach a lot of you know, <laughs> high performers. Um, what is the um, similarities between rowing and business? Oh yeah, yeah. There's a lot, and and I was talking about this the other day on a show. Uh, 
there's no, it's not a coincidence that many Olympic athletes end up teaching leadership training, going in and working with companies because when you, when you put on the hat of a high performance athlete or coach, you do things that are very strategic. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, it's understanding how things are positioned, how to get team buy-in and solidarity, understanding a common goal, creating a strategy for training, a quadrennial, creating a strategy for business growth, for a, creating an online program to, to coincide with a brick and mortar location. And, and you, have to, you have to put on a strategy cap. It's, it's no different. It's, it's what is your end goal? Olympics. What is your end goal? Online program. Okay, then we go into periodization training. Okay, what's year one of a quadrennial? What's year two? And you map it out into quarters. Same thing strategically in business. Reverse engineer back. What's your, what's your year one objectives? Great. What's your, your quarterly objectives? Let's work back. What's the ebb and flow of training? And, and so here's a huge similarity is athletes, athletes train themselves, as you know, at a high level. And it's, it's, it's a chessboard. It's understanding different elements of training at different times so that they maximize their ability and understanding the power of recovery, right? When uh, adaptation happens in a, um, uh, sorry, growth, excuse me, growth happens in adaptation phase and we, at, we adapt when we recover. How do we reduce our fatigue index, our residual fatigue as an athlete so that we can come back and then adapt and grow? In business, it's the same. I have entrepreneurs that are, that are go, you know, that are just go, 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 go. And yet, you know what? They need the recovery time. They need to put, pump the brakes, take, take the gas off, reassess, let their body, spirit, mind um, decompress, recharge, examine your business. Okay, what's working well? What's not working well? Let's course correct. You know, it, it, and, and I, I say this, I use Gary V as an example because when Gary V came out, you know, years ago, I'll go back five or six years. He was all about, I sleep four hours a night. I'm going to work all this. Now he's like, that's four hours has gone to eight hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and there's a reason because it, it, no one can sustain that at the end of the day, you cannot redline all the time. You need to understand priorities, strategize athletes and business owners. Also, I truly believe they need to understand their business. And in athletes, their business is, I'm not just showing up to do what the coach tells me. I understand this training is for this purpose. This is, this is the physiological effect it's going to have on me. This training that I do off the water is going to allow me this, is going to bring in the strength gains, is going to, you know? And so you, smart athletes, good athletes understand the process. And I feel the same for, for successful business owners and entrepreneurs out there. You have to understand the elements of your business, um, especially Joel, the the creative types out there. Mm -hmm. A lot of the the you know we I'm very fortunate enough to be involved with a heart led company and Leave Zone Strategies, and and me being a heart led human being, I understand energetics and I understand all that, and we work with a lot of those companies. But you, you still got to put the strategy work in. You need some of that kind of rigidity, some boundaries in there. You can't just be like, oh, well, you know, the universe will have map out. Well, the universe isn't just going to let an Olympic athlete win a gold medal. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there you have it. So before you became a coach, you went into acting. And that seems kind of like a weird um, <laughs> a career path from, you know, uh, you know, trained athlete, someone who, yeah. you know, has gone to the pinnacle of their um you know of rowing uh why can you explain a little bit about the thought process behind the decision to going to acting and and you know kind of a little bit of why you just yeah i guess why you decided to do that sure sure yeah yeah, yeah. i know I, I i have a few kind of zigs and zags along the way well the thing was is is when i first took up my coaching mantle i was still young i was i was 
fresh out of university. I was a head coach at 21, 22, 23 years old. And I knew instinctively though, there was always a calling for me to, to do more. And instinctively I've always, I, you know, ever since I was a kid, I either wanted to be an athlete or I wanted to be an actor. It was those two things. And, uh, and the one thing that rowing instilled in me was I can do anything I want to do. If I can overcome laying on the bathroom floor, you know, peed my pants and sitting there half naked and get up and play a tennis match and, and come out of that and then all of a sudden do one of the most demanding sports in the world and succeed at it. I'm like, no, I can, I can do anything. The unknown doesn't scare me. And so I, I got, I honored that adventure spirit in me. I truly did. And, and so I went to New York. I, um, I had a manager, I got a manager and I, I just started to make shit happen. I, I met a, a publicist and we put together a one man show. Uh, and so with zero acting experience, all of a sudden I had a one man show that ran off Broadway, Broadway for nine months. And, you know, and I, I started to kind of live that dream and, and that's really what I wanted to do for a number of years. And of course though, over time, <laughs> It's a very it's it's an it's a very difficult industry and there's mm -hmm. a lot of rejection and there's a lot of ego and there's all these things that can beat you down and and I will say that back then I was not equipped as a human being to to really handle the the limelight that occurred periodically and the the rejection and the and the lack of self-worth that occurred so as most people know many most people know that actors always are either waiters or they're bartenders or they're something, right? Yeah. So, so for me, what I was doing on the side to, to get steady income is I started bartending. And what had happened was the natural progression is all of a sudden I became a bar manager and all of a sudden I became a lounge manager. And I started, I started opening up kind of high profile places in, in New York. Uh, and so that to me, you know, being a manager is coaching. you you are a coach. And so I was able to kind of, I always had leadership in my blood. And so now I was really coaching, but just in a different arena and New York led to LA and same thing. And so I opened up a few properties in LA. And when I moved up to Vancouver, I started to become a director of operations and a general manager and running resorts. And it's like being a head coach. It's, it's the same. So it's, you learn the performance of, I had the performance of sport. Now I learned the performance of, of the business dynamic of running a team, you know, how to, how to, how to do all those things and understanding finances and, and allocating budgetary things and all of that nature. Right. And so it was kind of a natural progression of the coach that I think has always been in me. Hmm. Have you always, how, how do you overcome these challenges? Because I think a lot of people get stopped by the fear of like, oh, I can't go to New York and become an actor. I can't become a world-class athlete. Is it something that's just innate in you or is it something that you learned? It's a great question. It's a really good question, Joel, because I think it's a bit of both. I, I, I do feel everybody has that ability. I do. I do. I'm not cut from a different cloth. We're all genetically the same in a sense. I, I feel that we have that ability. I think what started for me though is <laughs> as a, as little Jimmy, I was always a dreamer, always a dreamer. And uh, I, I looked at dreams and, and movies and, and when I was, you know, swept away by heroes and, situations on the screen and that I'm like, well, why not me? Why not me? And so I've always adopted that mindset of like, well, really, what have I got to lose? Um, you know, and I know when you're younger, the stakes of life aren't that grand. And even like, even moving to New York, even though it was a big deal at 23, it really, it really wasn't in the grand scheme of life mm -hmm. compared to some of the some of the heavier decisions that I've made later on in life. I mean, it's like 
freaking Sesame Street versus, <laughs> you know, an Academy Award winning drama at that point. Uh, but I, but I always go back to the dreamer and I do believe why not me? Um, and that's a tool and a mantra that I've used a lot. And because I can, who's to say I can't. And, uh, you got to find that courage start first step starts with courage period too true so you going back to so you were a manager and then how did you make the leap into a performance coach mm. for for business and, and personal yeah. business development yeah well it was it was <laughs> really interesting actually and very serendipitous um and and this is where the acting came back in and, and opened up another door for me. So uh, while I was running a resort, uh, we, we decided to do a marketing campaign with, a, with, a, with Shaw TV, which is you know, the, the, a local cable company, uh, all, it's all across Canada at this point, uh, and do a series of commercials or a series of things where we promoted the resort. And it was gonna be done so uh, with a host. And so I was like, okay, this is really great. I love this avenue. The owner told me to, 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 to go for it, gave me the green light. And, but I told Shaw, I was like, you know what, though? The caveat is because I was in this world, I want a host that I feel exemplifies what our resort is about. Um, and so I couldn't, I couldn't sign off on some of the hosts that they were bringing to me. So finally I said, you know what? I'll do it. Why not? I mean... <laughs> Okay, I'm uncomfortable in front of the camera. So the the exec the Shaw executives were like, eh. <laughs> and I said, just trust me. And so I I I did it, and we shot an episode, and they were like, Renee was the the sales rep, and they were like, Renee, where did you find this guy? Like, where did this guy come from, right? So, <laughs> and not to toot my own horn, but I'm just I'm comfortable in front of the camera, right? I've had some experience, so I I get it, and. Uh, and so I started to do those spots. And what had happened was at that time, Joel, I was in a, definitely in a life transition. I was like, you know what? The six figure corner office salary, wearing my suits and that's not floating my boat anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I was really wanting more of that personal growth development and inspirational content. And so to feed that and honor that creative spark, I said, you know what? Originally, originally I was going to do a podcast, actually, is what I was going to do. Mm. And then I'm like, why don't I approach Shaw about having my own television show where I sit down and maybe interview people? So I did. <laughs> and uh, the Inspirational 30 was born. And so I had a show that ran for a couple seasons. I had 24 episodes, 23 episodes, where I sat down with inspirational people from all walks of life, Olympic athletes, authors, entrepreneurs, well, wellness advocates. And as I was searching for my guests, I ran into Isabel Mercier, who had just moved to Vancouver Island, fresh off a very empowering TED talk that she, she had done. So she was my guest on season one, episode number three. Mm. And we hit it off. We hit it off, of course. And, uh, and lo and behold, I think it was uh, four months after the show aired, uh, I ended up working for her and working for Leib's own company, uh, Leib's own strategies for her company, doing exactly that, taking my performance sport background, my performance business background, my and my inspirational self growth and all that, and my acting experience, if you will, tying that all in. Because now I actually, when I work with clients, I do a lot of on-camera stuff with them, right? I, I help them with their videos and create scripts and content. And so it's all played out perfectly, which is beautiful when you think about it. Mm. You know? It kind of ties itself all together, right? All, all your different um, jobs, all your different hats that you wore um, come into yes. play here, right? Yes. And, and it... It was, and I, all roads lead to something. And, and it was just, it was a reminder to me of just that. And, and 
I, I just, you know, I, I gave a lot of gratitude for that. It's like everything served a purpose. Um, you know, places that I lived, cities that I lived, mistakes, failing forward moments that, that led to different doorways of opportunity or, or, or you know, self check-ins, get my head on straight and, and, and elevate myself. It all led to, led to where I am now, which is finally, is I can truly say, an amazing, an amazing place. And uh, it, it took, some, took some deep work, though. Mm. What did you learn interviewing all those high performers? Uh, how amazing the human condition is that is as, as how vastly different we truly are and, and, and the way people view the world, the way that each of us handles hardship, pain, disease, victory, <laughs> defeat, all of those things. At the end of the day though, you know, we're still a, we're still a soul and we're a heartbeat. And I think, uh, I think that's the beauty of it is that we're all connected and, and, and especially in this time, you know, I feel like we've probably never been more connected with, with each other. And, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, when you can shift your perspective to what the chaos is surrounding us and realize, you know what, this, there's some beauty, there's some beauty in everything. Mm. And is there a typical client that you work with? Oh, uh, well, with Leap Zone Strategies, we predominantly work with with business owners or business startups. So it, it's it's geared towards that way, mm. uh, geared towards that. However, I always say, um, I, I ultimately I never coach a business. I coach people. I coach the person behind the business. Uh, mm. We. A brand is built on someone and somebody's energy and their personality. And, and so we are in the business of making human beings better. And uh, in terms of clients, uh, you know, it's, we have a cross spectrum. We, you know, we uh, are predominantly business heavy. Mm -hmm. We don't do, we don't do a lot of executive style coaching or life coaching. Uh, we have some clients that, that seek that usually that's part of what we do with our business, our business sector. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And is there a roadblock that you commonly see people come up against and, and how do they uh, overcome those? Yeah. Well, there's definitely a, there's definitely a few uh, for sure. Um, <clears throat> wow. How do I narrow that down to a, a potent <laughs> couple? Uh, well, yeah. So business owners, many business owners are not clear on how to, how to accurately differentiate themselves from their competitors. Mm. And at LeapZone, we use the term brand DNA, which is, which is a, a, a series of markers, cornerstones uh, that we put together, that we work with clients to understand because it becomes a, it becomes a Rosetta Stone, a language marker that creates congruency in everything they do. Because ultimately you can have the best product under the sun. If you can't actively convey that and convey how that product is different and why someone should desire to work with you regardless of price, you're setting yourself up for failure. So clear, concise language is huge because many human beings, many of us don't necessarily like to talk about ourselves and they don't want to they don't want to embellish they feel like it's oh it's my ego and you know it's it's, it's learning to to coax that out of to say hey you are unique mm -hmm. we need to we need to create that uniqueness to the language which which uh which, which will serve your your client base so that's a big thing that i see uh the second one would be a lot of people <clears throat> are not crystal clear on whom they're talking to their ideal clients. So we use the term the jungle. And a lot of times, especially business owners that are startup, they want money. Hey, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take people in. I'm not gonna turn away any business. And so they just start speaking to the entire jungle. 
And, you know, if they can get clear that, you know, my services can best serve a lion, a tiger, and a giraffe. And I understand equivocally what, what each of those three, three animals, what their pain points are, what their client avatars are. Then when I do my marketing, I know how to speak to that lion, which is going to be different than how do I speak to the giraffe and how do I speak to the tiger. So ideal clients um, and the power of saying no. There's so much freedom in saying no. These are my boundaries. These are my clients. This is my time. I honor myself. I'm not going to work 12 hours every day, right? The power of no and creating boundaries is huge. Mm. I think that, uh, you know, figuring out who you're talking to and who, like you, who, how you are uh, different from your, you know, competition. I think that's super important, you know, especially now where, you know, I'll, you know, the economy is just growing and growing and, you know, you can hire somebody in Asia, you can hire somebody in South, you know, South America, Europe, you know, there's no limits to who you uh, can, can hire or who you can uh, work with. And so I think that though, you know, it, it's very hard because now instead of competing with, you know, somebody in Vancouver, let's say, or Vancouver Island, you're competing against the whole world. And that's very daunting. I believe for business owners, because, you know, they have not just uh, distinguished themselves from, you know, their competition in locally, but globally as well. I spent, yes, Joel, hundred percent, especially now that the rules have changed where now everything is remote and, and now it's like, you need to, you need to speak, you need to speak clearly, uh, concisely, impactfully, um, and, and really, get to the emotional thread of, of your clients. Because people, at the end of the day, people work with us, people work, people buy, whatever it is, they, it, it's through emotion. Mm. Are they emotionally there? They don't buy with their intellect, they buy with their heart. And so uh, you have to find those clear ways to, to have that communication and, uh, and own it. It's ownership, you need to own your identity that you're creating just just like the personal brand walking around so you know the, it took a while and the james gardner that you see now is the same james gardner you'd see at starbucks or the same james gardner that's coaching a million dollar client or the same james gardner that's at the gym <laughs> you know there's there's no differentiation it's like i've shown up and, and owned who i am now yeah so how do you work with clients typically and get to where they want to be? How do we work with clients and get to where they want to be in terms of uh, achieving goals? Yeah. Or... Like, I mean, how, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I'm not sure where my brand position is, you know, I'm, I'm unclear about what we represent. What are some concrete ways that you work with them to, you know, help them, you know, see those markers and, you know, sure. you know, sure. in the pathway. So you just said it right there. Oh, well, I'm unclear of something. And, and at the end of the day, I think step number one that we work with every person that we work with, business, personal, doesn't matter. We have to get clear it on what it is we want. Mm -hmm. Human beings tend to get caught up in the how. Well, I, can't, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. How am I going to do that? How am I going to move to New York and be an actor? Uh, no. It's just, I, this is what I want. And so we always say, once you get crystal clear on what you want, the how will show itself. So it's, it, that would be the first thing. Uh, and then it is breaking it down. It is reverse engineering. Once you're clear, I have a client that wants a bucket list. I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro when I'm 50. Great, clear, reverse engineer back. When's the time frame? All right, in eight months. Okay. So what's what's the plan? Right? What do we do? Break it down. Okay, this is the plan for this week. This is the plan for week two. It's the same in business. I want to I want to create two new program offerings uh, in in you know in, in this year. Okay, so great. When are we gonna launch? Okay, well, quarter one is gonna be this. We have to create this type of thing, and then you break it down into its smallest bite sizable chunk that you're going to eat the elephant. It's no different. Um, and just taking the very first step, uh, 
whatever step that is, because, you know, I think we, we all know that first step sometimes is the hardest. We're, we're creatures of momentum yeah. and businesses thrive on momentum. And so momentum doesn't have to be these big needle movers. It can literally be a baby step. And, and, and then it's inertia. And then you start to trust, you start to trust the work. And that's a huge component of what we do. Getting a, getting someone to trust their truth. 100%. How do you use your vast experience, you know, through, you know, the different hats that you've worn uh, to help your clients? And I'll tell you why I asked this is because I've seen, there's so many coaches who've just done one thing. They've just, their experience is very narrow. And it, and it strikes me that it's, it's hard to be a coach when you just have a very narrow experience. Um, so somebody who has, you know, you know, so what, you know, done so much and been so many places, I think you can draw on that to help clients, you know, shift perspective or see things clearly or see things in a different way. Um, can you just talk a little bit yeah. about how you do that? Yeah, it's a really great point. And, and I recognize that about my journey and, and I give gratitude about it a lot because I, I, I mean, I have a lot of st st street life. It's like street cred. Um, you know, it's not like I'm going to go and get a coaching certificate and put it behind my wall and say, mm -hmm. oh, James Gardner is a certified life coach. It's like, no, I, I could, you know, I, and so so I understand that. And, and I think you're right in terms of having different hats or different life experiences to draw on. Okay. So it's a, it's a, inter, it's a deeply interwoven tapestry. And I feel that what that does is it allows for object objectivity. So I can come at situations with my clients from a mul multiple angles of understanding and awareness or, or intellect to, to see, okay, how am I going to tackle this? Or how, how am I, she's not, you know, he or she's not understanding this. Okay. How am I going to come in? How am I going to circumvent this and come in back door and, 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 and have it land. So they're like, ah, oh, there it is. Uh, it, it's all those things that I think add to, add to the color that I, that I truly believe that I, I bring to, to clients. And uh, uh, a lot of, that's why a lot of people continue to grow and I continue to grow. Uh, coaches will, will continue to grow. And I have, coaches have a bookshelf with all their books, right? And I have one over there, I've got my books. But what you don't see is, I have a bigger bookshelf, which is truly a book of life. Mm -hmm. And I got my book here from being a child with asthma and being weak. And I have my book of being the dreamer. And I have my book of, you know, courage of, to overcome a disease and whatever it is. And, and, and I never forget that. Uh, so I, I, I just, I don't know how I paint that brush with my clients. All that I know is it's there. And that library serves me um to to give clarity to my clients yeah mm. and to inspire and to just say why not me yeah <laughs> so speaking of books you have a book coming out can you tell us a little bit about that yes uh thank you for asking uh, it's been an amazing process joel i i'm i'm still in the editing phase uh it's called uh, conscious warrior going all in with love mm. And it is my, it's my life journey of, uh, of little Jimmy who, uh, uh, in a Rhode Island, you know, growing up in Rhode Island on the East coast of the States. And it, it chronicles five major arenas that I, I showed up and, and learn and, 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 you know, from, from wielding the sword of ego in New York and LA and, and getting caught up in superficial things and expectations and, and some, some major life events that, that have shaped me, including kind of stepping into my persona now, which is the conscious warrior, which is bringing grace into the warrior mindset. Uh, because I was always that, that 
guy in the battlefield just kicking ass and bodies lying on the floor, you know, some deservedly, some not, and because of my ego. And mm. so, and now it's, it's all about love. And so I'm still, I'm still that epic human. And yet I do everything with, with grace and love. Uh, so it's that journey uh, and culminating in, you know, in a, in a, in a, an event where I decided to, to leave my family, to honor my truth and to really, well, to, to unpack and true and go into the jungle, as I say, and find my truth and uh, emerge two and a half years later into who I am now. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's my story. So it's, uh, it's told with uh, different voices of my life. There's little Jimmy's voice, there's Jim's voice, and then there's James. You know, it's this evolution of, of my soul. Um, and uh, I bring in the dreamer, I bring in the inner child. And, and so it's, it's really been an amazing process of reconnecting for me too. Mm. Uh, and, and, I, and that's been the most fun for me as well. So, and so what were the five arenas that you talk about? Yeah, it, it centers around the areas that I lived. So it was Rhode Island, mm. there's New York City, there's LA, there's Vancouver, and then there's Vancouver Island. Mm. And in each of those arenas, the warrior went in, I waged war, you know, metaphorically in terms of battling life and, and learning things and gaining scars and, and, and you know, um, amassing superficial expectations and creating a false persona over the years. And, and so, you know, I, I talk about in the book where the moment I, the moment I moved to New York was the moment that I said goodbye to little Jimmy. It was mm. the moment that I lost my innocence. And, uh, and over the years, I, you know, it's, I, I get emotional talking about it. I, you know, that, that fissure just grew wider of my authentic self of who I thought I was, who I was destined to be and the type of person and the person that I was. And uh, with that jungle event came the ability to, to reconnect and now honor the, the man that I always knew little, that little Jimmy always knew he would grow up to be. Hmm. I mean, if you, you know, if you don't have to talk about this, but if, if you want, um, mm -hmm. What created that divide between your authentic self and, and the person you were trying to be? I think my unanswerable question, we all have an unanswerable question, and mine is, can my dreams be reality? And I think it was the, that coupled with my adventure spirit to seek and to be curious in life and to never settle uh, yet, yet when you, when you step on stage, when you step on the stage of life and when I stepped on the stages of New York and I started to model and I started to get accolades and then run these resorts and, and, the attention grew and, and the ego, ego responds well to attention. And then I started to want to become things and have things for all the wrong reasons. Um, I, I, you know, I, I wanted to be an actor because I wanted to make people feel and, and, and cry and laugh and escape the mundane. And I got away from that. And then I wanted to be an ego, an actor because I was hanging out with celebrities all the time and I was having, you know, going to epic parties and I had the, the beautiful woman, you know, on my arm and it's all superficial. And so it's, I never, I never got into drugs, but it was a drug, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that, that, and I, and don't get me wrong, Joel, it's not, not like I, I was celebrity by any stretch. I, I had glimpses of that on my level. I had glimpses of that fame of, you know, being a high profile general manager or everybody wanting my time and my attention. 
whether I was an acting gig or just in life, it was there. And, and so, and then with that though, comes, comes, it's not me. And then what happened to me? And then, well, I'm stuck. How the fuck am I going to get me back? And, and then, and, and then life becomes half gl a glass, half empty. Mm. And then you start, eh, why do I want to get out of bed today? Or, eh, you know, I'm only going to go, I'm not going to go all in. That was my mantra. I always went all in. And then some now, I, and then later in life, I started going half ass in on things. I'm like, that's not me. Yeah. Mm. And it, it took, it took me destroying my family for a time to allow me to sit in this very place that I'm in now and, and just sit. It wasn't, you know, we've heard the term dark night of the soul. Well, it was a dark two years of the soul and it was a repetitive on, it was a groove stuck in a record and that needle wasn't budging. Mm. And uh, finally I clawed out of it. And, and when I did that, when I searched long and hard in the jungle, I, I, I used the term tree of life. I arrived at this tree of life. It was this creation of me. It was this rebirth where I, I just, everything all the the scars and the 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 expectations and the ego driven all of that melted off of me and so when i started to re-emerge which is a process it's not like i woke up and was like woohoo right <laughs> no i'm good now yeah <laughs> <laughs> i know right when i started to re-emerge though now i was consciously aware to just bring back things that served me hmm and say no to the things that didn't. So it was like I, and now I, 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 that's what I do. I only choose to have things attached to me or my energy that are of the same frequency or higher. And that's it, yeah. And how was going back uh, during the writing process and revisiting those times in your life? Mm. You know, it was amazing. And a short word is amazing. and. The long answer, if not the long answer, but it's something that I think would serve everybody. They don't have to write a book, but if they could go and just journal and sit down with themselves and just, just write about some memory that comes to mind. Because for me, honestly, that, that was a, a, a new lease on life. It, it reinvigorated my soul more than I ever thought it would. And even when I had to relive a lot of the shit sandwiches that I, that I had to eat and, and digest, it's like, no, this has shaped me. It's ownership of all of that. And uh, it's empowering process. Uh, I, I've been, you know, I, I spent the first draft. I, I it took me exactly five months and or tw yeah, 20 weeks and one day. And for 20 weeks and one day, I wrote, every single day and, and and i have it it's in my notebook i would write down my little numbers at the end of each day and my and then my week tallies and so it was an amazing time frame for me to do that and the amazing thing about it joel is i did it in some of those arenas so when i started the book i ended up going to rhode island i spent five weeks in rhode island mm where I wrote the Rhode Island and well, half really? because I already oh, started wow. the Rhode Island, but I finished the Rhode Island arena and I wrote all the East coast arena, huh. which was amazing. And then I finished the New York arena one day before I hopped in a plane to come to the West coast. Mm. So the very next day at the airport, I started writing the journey to the West coast where I went across, I drove across the country. I landed here. I sat on my balcony and started writing in August when I came back. And now I was writing LA. I was writing Vancouver, coming up to Vancouver and, and all of that. So it's been a very, a very serendipitous moment. So much so, and, and I, I couldn't make this shit up if I tried. The 20 weeks in one day that mm. I finished. Well, a year ago, November 9th, uh, sorry, November 2nd, 2019 was when I stepped out 
of into the James Gardner, who I am now. Hmm. I finished the book exactly on November 2nd, 2020. Hmm. Wow. On my, on my kid's life. I, I talked about it on social media. I didn't plan it that way. I did not plan it that way. It just happened. Hmm. So, uh, so that was the long wind to say amazing experience. If anybody, you don't have to write a book. You just need to write. It's a window to your own soul. It's a way to, to self love, to, to, reconnect to the inner child that I think a lot of us lose when, when life, when real life comes calling and it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. What inspired you to start this book in the first place? It was a podcast. I think it's probably the podcast that you listened to. Was it the obstacle course podcast? Was that the one that you listened yes. to? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, John and Andrew were, were amazing souls. They sat down with me and, and before we knew it, we had a two hour podcast. Yeah, it was long. <laughs> it was a long one, right? Yeah. And, and because they want, like we just started riffing on my life and it was just sequential. And, and that was the seed of like, man, you, you, you got some interesting stuff there. And, 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 you know, a lot of great kind of breadcrumbs and sprinkles of unique things in your life you should, you should, you should write a book. And I've had a few people mention that, but it wasn't until I did that podcast where I got to relive my, that was the first time that I actually talked in length about my journey. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm like, holy H, like, you know, this is, this is pretty cool. Like I know, I mean, everyone has their own story. Mine's unique to me. And, and I do know that it's different than a lot, than a lot than different than many. So, and I thought because of my journey to whom I was from the little kid to the, to the gym, to now to the James and the work that I do, I thought it would be a great inspirational, inspirational book and, and touching and funny and witty. And yeah. Yeah. I'm curious to to delve a little bit deeper on this, but did you set, because I mean, you know, you must be a goal setter and, and uh, you know, you achieve so much. So do you, did you set like daily targets of how much you want to write, you know, and, and, you know, when you wanted to finish the book? Yeah. Um, it, yes. So I, I am definitely a strategist for sure. Uh, I, I gave myself permission. Originally, I wanted to finish the book um, with my writing coach, Tina Overbury, who was amazing. Tina Overbury's been a godsend in this. And she's a great friend and colleague of mine as well. She's been steering me. And originally, I told her that I wanted to finish the book by the end of September, at least the first draft, mm. like the, the heavy lifting. And um, we, we thought it was doable. And, and in retrospect, I finished November 2nd, like I said. The thing is, is though I had days, I just wrote, I just channeled what I wrote. So I was going to say, oh, I want to at least do 500 words a day or whatever. And I gave, it was more of time. So for me, because I have a full client roster, um, I would always get up and I'd have a two hour window in the morning. And because I was very blessed to be channeling this, my story, I would be able to bang out a thousand words or, you know, 1500 words some days, uh, in the, in that time frame, And, uh, uh, which is a lot when you're writing, like, you know, mm -hmm. writing can be meticulous sometimes, but there were days where I was like, you know, you know, it's a 500 word day. This is a, a 250 word day. I think I, I, I did set the bar. It's like minimum 250. Mm. I got to sit down and just write if I have a crazy day or something. And I, and I did it. I had, I don't know, maybe four or five of those low bar days in the whole process. And then there were great days, Joel, where, it, you know, I, I, because I, I have a Wi-Fi lifestyle with coaching, I can reorganize clients. I can pad days and, and, and kind of create my own schedule. So when mm -hmm. I was in Rhode Island for the summer, man, I was, I all my colleagues and friends were laughing because I'd be sending selfies at the office and I'd be on the beach. I'd be on the bluffs by the lighthouse and I'd be writing for five hours, like just sitting there giving her. Right. And, and so 
I had those epic days where I was kind of Hemingway-ish, where I was just lost in my own world. And, and uh, so it was, it was an ebb and flow. Uh, so to answer your question, I mean, I had a strategy, but it was a loose framework. Mm-hmm. Was, the non-negotiable was right every day. Gotcha. That was the non-negotiable. So. Do you have a publication date? No, no, no. Uh, we'll have to circle back around with that. It, it's, I don't know. It's just, it's going to depend on the rewrites. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, which is an amazing process in of itself. Now it's, uh, it's like, you're all of a sudden I'm making, making stuff better. I'm like, Whoa, this is really good. But it's interesting because now the channeling is gone and now I'll sit here for two hours but I'll just, and I'll just work on like half a page. <laughs> Rewording and then right? changing it back. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, but but then what, when you hit it, you're like, oh man, that's way better. Yeah. And that's, that's the part of the process too. So I'm not as much as I would love to have this out in the next three months, it's not going to happen, nor do I want to rush it. I want to honor the, the journey of this because it's still teaching me a lot. Yeah. Cool. And it gives me, great stuff to talk about with people like you. (laughs) Well, James, I'm going to ask you one last question. We'll wrap it up. Um, You know, keeping on the theme of books, is there a particular book that has inspired you or a favorite book or one that you like to gift? (laughs) You can name a couple if you want. (laughs) Yeah, I'm looking looking over there because I'm looking at my bookshelf. So, well, the inner child in me who never leaves my side now, um, I would gift everyone a copy of a book, a, a, a non, no one knows this book. It's called Scuttle, the Stowaway Mouse. Hmm. And it's a picture book about a mouse who wanted to go on a pirate adventure and got himself mixed up with a bunch of wharf rats and, and ended up saving the day and becoming his own captain on a pirate ship. And, uh, that book is heavily influenced in my, in my, in my book, because as a young child in the hospital, that book was always under my arm and I would read from that book and I would do performances for the candy stripers and the nurses on the pediatric ward who all knew my name. Cause I was there all the flipping time. So that book was super, inspir- <laughs> super instrumental in me standing here today. Um, obviously that would be my inner child pick. Um, you know, I'm going to go back to Think and Grow Rich. Mm, classic. It is a classic and uh, it, it's time tested. Time tested. Um, and I, I think it will always stay the, the, the test of time. That would be a big one. Uh, Essentialism by Greg McCown. Mm, that's a good one too. Uh, th- yeah, that would be a gifter for me. Uh, I, I feel that uh, there's a lot of power in the simplicity and understanding what serves one and what doesn't and and what we really need and how finding out what we need and, and diminishing some of that can really increase our units of happiness. That would be a big one. And I'll lastly say, this is a good book, but I haven't finished it yet, so I, I won't. <laughs> I won't. I won't pitch McConaughey's book because I haven't finished it, but it's flipping amazing. Okay, yeah, I've uh, I have it to read for sure. Okay. It's on my yeah. to read to to read list. And I, you know what? I'll do. I'll stick with that. Okay. Because I'm halfway through, and there's a ton of value in there. It's a great read. It's a great unique lens on life, and uh, and very similar to what we what you asked about writing for me and the journey and, and when I'm talking about journaling, it stems from him, his 35 years of keeping journals, I think it was, of all his just musings. Yeah. And and there's a lot of power in and just getting stuff out of our noggin and down. So yeah, definitely that for sure. All right. That's a great place to cap it off. James, where can people find you? Sure. Uh, James Gardner, obviously, uh, leapzonestrategies.com. Uh, we can also find me on Facebook, James Gardner. I have a, a public figure page and a personal page, of course. Instagram is James Gardner 
underscore underscore underscore. <laughs> I think it's three. It has to be yeah, three underscores because that was the only way you get James Gardner. So, uh, but all these James Gardner is out there. Yeah, I know, right? There's <laughs> there'll be uh, there's keys in there like rowing and leap zone, and you'll find the James Gardner you need to find. So, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Well, James, thank you so much for your time for sharing your stories. They are super impactful. Um, and have a great day. Thank you, Joel. I really appreciate uh, sharing me, giving me the space and allowing uh, to me to show up and be heard and seen. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Publishing for Profit. Please like and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.